I'm David Kaplan. I'm a professor of particle physics at Johns Hopkins University, and I produced Particle Fever. How did, is this your first film? Uh, this is my first film. How Absolutely. does a particle physicist uh, turn into a filmmaker? Uh, I only have one data point, so I can't tell you how a particle physicist turns into how a filmmaker. How did this particle physicist <laughs> turn into a particle filmmaker? The truth is, um, I did start as a film major in college, and about two years in, I decided I'd never make it in film, that it was too hard, I wasn't dedicated enough, and so I transferred to Berkeley and became a, well, I got a degree in physics, which I found much easier. And you many, already had somewhat of an interest and in, in background in physics. Yeah, I mean, I was good in physics in high school, and I loved, I mean, when I was a kid, my dad didn't read bedtime stories to me. He basically taught me number theory. Uh, because he loved it, not because he was a mathematician, but he just wanted to, someone to talk to about it. <laughs> and I, I started talking about it when I was nine, and uh, since then was just inherently good and added and interested in it. The film is fantastic. I've seen it. Um, I loved it. And, uh, you know, it's hard to make it an exciting, it's rare to make an exciting documentary about yeah. science and a hard science like this, too. And uh, it doesn't hurt that Walter Murch edited it. That's How did hurt. that come about? Well, uh, so first of all, I knew something exciting was about to happen. So this was this was in 2005. I was telling all of my family members the machine would turn on. It could completely change our field. Everybody working in the field would be affected by it, and it could basically erase everything we've ever done. So it was inherently dramatic, and in. In addition, my world is so beautiful. I just wanted always to share it with people around me. When it started, my idea of make a film, and I started attracting people and more and more people, I did attract a guy named Mark Levinson, who ended up directing the film. And Mark uh, met Walter Murch, the great Walter Murch, uh, on The Unbearable Lightness of Being in the 80s. And Walter has an inherent love of physics and discovered there was somebody with a physics degree, Mark had a physics degree, who was, you know, a peon on this film, Unbearable Lightness of Being, wanted to have lunch with this guy. And Mark thought, my God, Walter Murch wants to have lunch with me. And they've been friends ever since. And when Mark started working on this, he told Walter, and Walter was excited about it from the beginning. And when he w it was clear we had enough interesting stuff, and our first editor assembled something interesting, uh, Mark sent it to Walter. And Walter was incredibly excited. And we begged him, asked him, and he said yes. So I think uh, it's a lesson. It never hurt to ask. You think you can't get the greats, but if you're doing something they find interesting, they'll do it. That's excellent. And it, uh, so it does, it has great content. Whether the whole world realizes it or not, you knew that you have great content, and then you have this, right. the, the filmmaking team did a great job. Um, you just said, something about how beautiful the world is that you study and understand. What do you mean by that? Like, what's beautiful about it? And are you talking about particle physics? Yeah, I mean, I think science in general, but particle physics in particular is extremely beautiful. Uh, I would say for two core reasons. One is the attitude within the community is so clean and honest. We are all after something that is true. And ego really does not get in the way. You can yell at somebody, tell them they're being an idiot, and it's never personal. It's always about getting to what is true. And the second part of what makes it so beautiful is not only is the physics itself inherently gorgeous, but it's something outside of the human being. We're communicating with something that's outside of us. And we get to ask it questions and it responds. We get to learn things from something which is inherently other but in the end is of course part of ourselves and that sort of pureness and beauty to it for me is unmatchable and uh and i be, those two additions i think just made uh me while i'm a sort of crazy person full of anxiety and do all kinds of things and get upset a lot there's an inherent contentment in my life and and it has to do with the people around me how they think what they care about and what i do and I just wanted everybody to experience that. And it became an opportunity when we were going through something together, which was very emotional and dramatic. And so this was an opportunity to get people in and follow a clean narrative story, which maybe is less complicated than the average 
time in physics. Yeah, that was very helpful. Let me ask you a couple questions about, so what is, what's the, can you tell me something about the nature of your research? What do you specifically, <laughs> sure. historically, and, and what has it led up to? My uh, research is focused on what's called physics beyond the standard model. The standard model of particle physics has been theoretically constructed roughly in the 1970s, um, has some deep holes in it that are not explained by it, uh, that we would like to explain. And my research is focused on those deep holes. Uh, one becoming classic one is the existence of what we call dark matter. Dark matter, uh, it turns out in many different ways, if you look at the universe, you can tell that 80% of the matter in the universe is not made of atoms. It does not interact with light in any significant way. Uh, it is the reason for the formation of galaxies, and we have no idea what it is. So um, that is an inherently amazing problem. And uh, so I've spent many years attempting to both uh, figure out what it could be, writing down theoretical toy models or actual models of what the dark matter could be, and at the same time proposing ideas of how one might test those or other types of things that could be dark matter. So there's a lot of pushing on that, figuring out what dark matter could be and uh, how we might actually see it. Um, we don't know what it is yet. So has any of my work led to anything important? I have no idea. <laughs> if we discover it and when we discover it, we'll know well, if I happen to be in the right direction. But uh, more importantly, the fact that there are a number of people working and pushing in all directions, we have a much better chance of figuring out what it is. Well, as hard a problem as dark matter is, even normal matter that we feel <laughs> like we've understood for so long, uh, what, what is matter? What is matter? You know, when we do experiments like the Large Hadron Collider, we are smashing things together at very high energies. And I think um, the, the misconception is that we're breaking things apart and seeing what's inside of them, what's the littler bits. And it's simply not true. What we're doing by colliding things together at high energies is attempting to excite the vacuum of space itself. You see, quantum mechanics expresses the fact that particles act like waves most of the time. They propagate through space as if it was a wave. And waves are weird things that are spread out and have some inherent frequency to them. And when you wanna look at something extremely tiny, you need to use light or a wave that has extremely tiny wavelength because then you can resolve very tiny things. And so the Large Hadron Collider is in a sense a microscope which uses light, but particles, uh, at such high energies, their wavelength is so tiny, it can investigate extremely tiny things. But instead of bouncing the light off of an object and letting it go into your eyes, you can see it, we're bouncing two objects off of the vacuum itself. And what comes out is a reflection, or more like a refraction, of what information is contained in the vacuum. And so particle creation that occurs at the LHC and other colliders is really uh, energizing a little spot in the vacuum of space-time and seeing what it's made of. And all the stuff that comes out is a reflection of exactly that. So particles themselves are not inherent property. They're not fundamental because they can be annihilated and created. What is fundamental is the information living in the vacuum, and we call that fields, or at least that's the best description of them. So yes, yeah, space itself. So is this really happening? Is this what quantum physics says? Is that in the empty, quote unquote, empty vacuum of space, particles are constantly coming into existence and annihilating each other? And uh, I guess that's a question. I guess I'm also asking then, what yeah. is space? Yeah, uh, what is space? Good question. I don't know. Uh, we have models of it. Um, you know, we've acted a lot for a long time and but it's, it's been not just nothing, is it? It's not like we think of space it's as not. empty space unless there's something in it, but that's not quite true, is it, it? It's better to think of space as a material, but it's a material that has very special properties. Um, if you take any material and then you move through it, you can tell you're moving through it. You feel that sort of the friction, there's viscosity. You, you, life is different if you're moving through water whether or you're standing still in water. Space, 
avoids that property. It has what we call um, relativistic symmetries. It follows the rules of Einstein's relativity. And so whether you're moving or standing still, you can't tell with respect to space. But it doesn't mean that space itself is empty or doesn't contain things. It has properties in and of itself. And you can uh, sort of manifest those properties or touch those properties uh, if you put enough energy into it or if you can probe space at extremely tiny distances. And when we talk about quantum mechanics, uh, some sort of examples are the fact that particles appear and disappear constantly, spontaneously all the time. Um, this is a weird approximation metaphor for what's actually happening, but it is it is better said that the that space-time itself is better described as a condensate of particles and particles of all densities moving in all directions at all velocities. And because of that universality to it, if you're moving through space or standing still in space, the properties are identical. There is no difference between the experience of those two. Science experiments come out the same. Um, we don't have an intuition for that, but mathematically one can construct it, it makes sense, and it leads to predictions about what the subatomic world does and how it acts. And they've come out incredibly, not only qualitatively true, but quantitatively, you know, to many decimal places true. So we're on to something, um, but, you know, at some point you investigate so deeply what you see is not intuitive at all. It's not something that we have instinct for. We're, we, we haven't evolved to uh, relate to quantum mechanics because it really operates in its fundamental way at short distances, at short length scales. And we're big floppy objects and that stuff gets averaged out and we never get to experience it like that. It seems like you hear mathematicians and physicists talking about what the equations say. There must be a lot of stuff. It, it seems there must be a lot of stuff that, that, that you can understand by looking at the equations and it might be impossible to put into English words. Yes, that's a great uh, comment. I mean, yeah, the, the English language or probably any you know written language that, that is used uh, beyond mathematics uh, does fall short. And uh, you know, there, it's, there's a double problem. One is that the language isn't designed to account for phenomena that nobody experiences. We make up our own words, but I don't know how helpful they are to people, the uninitiated. Um, and also, the, the physics is inherently non-intuitive. So if you try to describe it in physical terms, um, it, it, you can't picture it, you don't get it. Uh, so there, there's a limit, and which is why I think, you know, it's very important for scientists to go out there and explain what we're doing and talk in detail about it, the physics, or whatever the science is. Uh, and it's very important that the public learns more math because that happens to be the language that the universe speaks. We didn't, you know, it wasn't our choice. It just, that's what it is. The deeper you go, the more complex mathematical structures beautifully describe the universe. And that's just a phenomenon. The beginning of the universe, the interactions of fundamental interactions of particles, uh, how materials work, temperature, thermodynamics, everything. I don't know why, but that's it. So if you want to speak to, if you're sick of human beings, and you'd like to talk to somebody else, the universe is just sitting there waiting for you, but you have to learn the language. You, you don't want to be the ugly American that expects everybody to speak English. You should learn some math and then see if you can understand it. Is space infinite? Is the universe infinite? And what does that even mean? How is that even possible? Can you conceive of that? I, I'm, Good. I can't conceive of it being finite or infinite. Yeah, is space infinite? And, uh, and what does that mean? Uh, this is easy. Uh, we don't know what, if it is, we don't, we don't know because we can only see a finite distance because of the light travel time and because of the properties of our universe at 13.7 billion years ago, namely that it was incredibly dense and uh, light didn't pass through it. So there's a surface of last scattering, the last time light hit, knocked into something and then the universe cooled enough that it became transparent. So light now is traveling in all directions. And 13.7 billion years ago, we build equipment that's sensitive enough to see it. And uh, what we're seeing is the oldest light because the light older than that was bouncing around and didn't get to us. Eventually it bounced around, it cooled enough and headed towards us. So you can only see a finite size, uh, 13.7 billion 
uh, light years in effect. It's uh, There are complications in that description, but let's just sort of on the order, you know, tens of billions of years. You can't go farther than that. So if the universe is finite or infinite, but not beyond that, we don't know. We can't Do measure. We don't have access to it. Else? We can set up both. <laughs> we can set up finite and infinite. Um, the, there was an inherent thought that maybe the universe would be a closed universe, which is something oh, it expands and then we collapses. That has to do with the, the local curvature of the universe. Um, if it came out to be closed, the space time would have a curvature as if it could be a ball, in which case we'd say, oh, it looks finite. It has the, it has the topology of a finite uh, surface, a uh, three-dimensional hypersurface. Or it could have turned out to be uh, an open surface, which is sort of like the surface of a saddle where you can't close up on itself. It sort of bends this way and this way. Uh, and it turned out to be neither of those. It turned out to be exceedingly flat. And uh, so flat that, po and we're gonna keep measuring that, but at some point it'll be so flat that we'll be sensitive to noise fluctuations and we won't know. It could be infinitely flat. So if it's infinitely flat, truly infinitely flat, um, but though we'll never be able to measure that, then we'd say that it's infinite. What does it mean? You know, the English language is not ready for this. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but math, Maybe no, there's a Yiddish no problem. phrase for it. Uh, maybe there's a Yiddish phrase. Yeah. Uh, yeah Germans you get, have words you get for a lot of things. looking at it or something. <laughs> What's the question you most want the answer to? What's the question I most want the answer to? Um... Uh, holy crap. I don't think the English language, uh, I mean, I would like to know what space time is. You know, I would like a better description of space time so that we don't have these inherent debates about uh, quantum gravity or black holes or uh, locality. That's what I would like to do. And, I, and I'm gearing up for it. I don't know if I'll be the one to, to, to make any progress in that, but I will, that's what I plan to do in the next five years.